Hi, everyone. In just a minute, we'll be diving into a close look at three recent reads of mine, namely the Inkal Black and White Deluxe Edition by Jodorowsky and Mobius, Life of Che by Hector German Osterfeld, Alberto Breccia and Enrique Breccia, and The Forest by Thomas Ott. But before that, I'd like to quickly note a historic occasion. For the first time in our history, every comic in this video has been purchased by by funds donated and contributed by viewers and subscribers. During the live streams that I've been doing more of since late last year, I was surprised and very grateful to find people contributing super chats, something I knew very little about before I started live streaming. There was no doubt in my mind that I would use this money, whether it was a $2 contribution or a $40 contribution, you know who you are. There was no doubt in my mind that I would be using this to buy comics to spotlight on this channel, which is what I've done today. One of these, the Inkal Deluxe Edition, is something I was curious about and thought that would be something that viewers of this channel would also be curious about. The Che biography is part of me discovering Breccia, thanks to Fantagraphics bringing all of Breccia's work out in English. And Thomas Ott is an old favorite with a new book out. I thought this was a good spectrum of the kind of comics that I would buy thanks to you. So very quickly, I'd like to thank specifically Arvind Ramanathan, Book Aya 619, Brainwave, Gabriel D, Pratay Ghosh, Tommy, Samuel S.G., Antoine Dennison, Sleepy Reader 666, aka Damien, Sumit Kumar of Buckermax.com, and Tallman T14 for their contributions. Thank you so much, folks. And thank you, everyone else who continues to watch and interact with these videos. Now, let's jump into a closer look at these three books. The Inkal Black and White Deluxe Edition is a special edition of the sci-fi classic, the European comic that has influenced countless things in media from movies, video games, novels. It's really hard to estimate how influential this book has been. This edition is published by Humanoids, who brings out the Inkal in all its forms that I know of. I think they're the ones who have the rights for it. Definitely in English, all editions that I've encountered are published by Humanoids, and they have previously published this uh, standard edition, which shrinks down the original European format, as well as I think what's called the Special Deluxe Collectors something edition, which the main draw off is that it is in the original large size format rather than the more shrunken down version that was released for English readers. I do have a video comparing these two editions, so we're not going to get into that. But the first striking thing about the black and white deluxe edition is that it retains that original size. There's no shrinking down in this version of this classic. But of course, that's not the main draw of this edition, although it's a nice little thing to have on the side. The main draw is that this is a black and white edition. Now, the Inkal was never a black and white comic. It was always a color comic. So this isn't some sort of original edition instead of a recoloring that happened later. Rather, this edition subtracts the color from the original to better highlight and spotlight Mobius's terrific art. And now immediately, I have to say, when I first heard about this edition, I was a little torn. As much as I like black and white editions and editions that highlight the line work and the artwork, as much as I like those kind of editions, the Inkal's colors, uh, to me, are such a vital and important part of this book that I didn't really understand what would be gained by removing those colors. I mean, I understood the theory, but I wasn't really sure if I wanted to see something like this, something whose identity, at least in my mind, is so tied into the way that color works. And it's part of the experience to me, um, especially in chapters like this, in an almost... Uh, 
undivorceable way. So when I first heard about this edition, I was a little confused as to what they wanted to gain. But then, as I said, I do like black and white editions. I do like artist editions and gallery editions, some of which I've featured on this channel before. And I thought that, yes, this would be something that celebrates the art in a different way, not better or worse, but a different way uh, than the original. But still, being an expensive book, I did waffle about it. I did wonder if it was worth getting this edition. But then again, the generosity of my viewers and subscribers helped me decide that, yes, I do want to take a look at this and I do want it to be sponsored by them because that might be a video that people enjoy. So maybe with tight budgets and unlimited choices, I wouldn't normally have picked up this edition. But having made a video on the Inkal and having received a lot of questions about it and a lot of discussion around it, I thought it would be fitting to get this for a quick comparison. Starting from the very first pages, one of the things I realized is that Mobius's art isn't lean clear. That means it isn't equal weight. There are thicker lines and thinner lines. But even the thickest of lines are actually quite thin. The difference between the line weight, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, I'm not an art expert, but the difference in the weight didn't seem to be as great as many cartoonists and comic artists use which meant that the separation was actually quite uh, influenced by the lack of color. My first impression was that, wow, the color really uh, provides a lot more depth than I had thought of. Using not just contrasts between the foreground and the background, but also slight shades and variations in the same color. And looking at the black and white pages first by itself and then in comparison seems like a wholly different experience. This splash page, one of the most iconic and recognizable from this comic, it's interesting to see how many times we've seen this. And if you read more of this comic and more of other comics, you'll see this one scene happen over and over again. No matter how many different ways and times we have seen this, this still looks like something new and something fresh. Over here, my eye seems to be guided to certain areas and therefore move in a way that is a lot more uh, democratic and open world over here. This and other pages with this kind of detail remind me of reading someone like Jeff Darrow, where you could be looking in every corner for things that you may have missed and something that you could do with the color pages too, of course. But I think the order in which you would do that is very different here than it is over here. Original pages which are less vibrant or have less of a color spectrum are also interesting to compare. Once again, there's definitely the way the foreground stands out over here versus the relative flatness. And to me, in certain kinds of panels where there was a lot more flat or uniform coloring, these do look a bit incomplete. Uh, but that's okay because I'm not reading this edition as some sort of a definitive edition of the Ingal. This I don't think can serve as or is even meant to be the only edition of the Inkal you have. Although like with everything else, there might be some people who just prefer this version and only want this version. Because this isn't supposed to be definitive and because this I do think is more of a collector's item and a fan's item, something that allows you to see something familiar and iconic in a different way, but also get a deeper appreciation for the line work and the art involved. Because of that, I do think that every single page is a different experience. In some cases, you may far prefer the original. And in some cases, the black and white version might be quite revelatory. To me, one of the best examples of that is this panel over here. Because Mobius's artwork is all black and white, there is no grays and there's no shading. Because it's completely black and white, it's also shadows that are conveyed through the colors. Something that seems obvious to me now, but I hadn't really realized. So in this panel, you have uh, our central character in the light over here, and he is exposed, uh, quite literally, in a completely different way than the, the people we see in the foreground. So over here, we're getting contrast not just with blue and orange and green, but we're also getting the sense of her and her giant rat coming out of the shadows into this little bit of spotlight. And this is completely about the color, because when we look at this panel, 
she is actually in the foreground and all of the white on this rat mouse means that our eyes are immediately drawn to this section first and we get to him almost later. Once again, this is purely democratic, so you could actually have your eye drawn to any place. But I think just from who's in the shadow and who's in the light changing, the storytelling is significantly different. I think more than anything, what this edition shows is how much the color played a part in the storytelling or the final effect that this comic had. And really how much confidence Morbius seems to have had in his colorist, because this is colored by someone other than Morbius, which is not something, again, I knew right at the beginning. But Morbius seems to have had a lot of confidence in his colorist because he leaves it almost up to the colors to determine what will be the foreground, what will be the emphasis, and what will be the mood. The lack of that coding or that guide to the color in this art and the openness and democratic nature of it and the way that that changes the way you could read this story to me makes this book worth the price. Now I'll completely understand if someone thinks this is sacrilegious and how could you possibly take out the colors that make this book what it is and I think to a certain extent that can be applied to all black and white editions of things that have colors. I know that a lot of people feel that way about Watchmen Noir and the colors in Watchmen are so important and then there are all these other questions we have about recoloring and what changes what but this edition again is for collectors and for fans it's for a different point of view. I will admit that it isn't everything I would have liked it to be. First of all, I'm grateful that it's the original size, but this could have been an opportunity to give us something that we don't have before, i.e. a larger size, more than the original, sort of the way the artist editions and gallery editions do. And the other thing is that as much as I love looking at this line work, I wish it had been pencils or inks rather than the final printed line work. In that way, this isn't really like the the artist or gallery editions at all because this isn't about original art. This is more like the DC Noir editions which just take the color away. But those are really nitpicks of mine. I do wonder if I would have picked this up were it not sponsored by my viewers but I don't have to think about that too much because here it is. From a new version of something classic and familiar to something being almost born again. Life of Che is a graphic biography, a comics biography of the famous, infamous revolutionary by the team of Hector German Osterheld and Alberto Breccia, who had collaborated previously on Mort Cinder, and Enrique Breccia, Alberto's son. Life of Che was published only two years after the death of Che Guevara, and was apparently extremely successful until, until a few years later when the ruling military dictatorship banned all of Osterheld's work and destroyed the files and this book. All known copies and means to reproduce it were apparently destroyed. A surviving print copy found its way to Spain where it was restored and printed, and this is the first time it's been translated into English. For that alone, I think this is a significant thing. I've only recently, over the last couple of years, become familiar with Alberto Breccia. And I talked a little bit about Mort Cinder, Paramus and the Eternaut in my uh, favorite discoveries of 2021 video. This is the fifth volume from Fantagraphics in their Alberto Breccia series. After the three I mentioned in that video, volume four was Dracula. And this, I think, continues the significant work Fantagraphics are doing in introducing people like me to someone and some people that they may not have otherwise gotten to know about. I found this book to be fantastic, but not necessarily as a biography. I mean, just as a comic and just as a piece of storytelling, I thought this was superb. It does take the approach more of a hagiography, which is a word that used to mean the life of saints, a biography of a saint, but is uh, these days come to mean a biography that doesn't really go into the faults and the flaws of its subject, but really seeks to uh, exalt them. And that might have been a little off-putting 
except for a couple of very important things. It is very intentionally written and it's even titled an impressionistic biography. Uh, although deeply researched and based in truth, it makes no claims to being comprehensive and well-rounded. Rather, this comic gets to the essence of Che or his philosophy or what he could have stood for and what he really uh, was against. And this isn't done in a complex or nuanced way by showing him warts and all, but really giving us fleeting snatches and moments that are very, very temporary. Rather than go in a very standard birth to death format, uh, this slim biography is structured, written and drawn in a very unique manner. Alberto Breccia worked on this with his son and they actually have separate art duties. This story is framed by Che's last days in Bolivia and these sections are drawn by Enrique Breccia in a very thick woodcut style. These final days in Bolivia are interspersed by flashback chapters which are drawn by Alberto Breccia who uses a variety of different styles including multimedia and collage to tell these pieces. The artwork by both the Breccias is stunning and impressive in the use of black and white if how shapes and shadows form the stories, uh, again, impression rather than literally spelling things out for you. That's not to say there aren't visceral moments, but Again, as a biography, this is a much more philosophical and principle-oriented one, which flits from moment to moment and incident to incident in a way that's not really interested in being comprehensive, but more creating a mosaic that could maybe flesh out the man we're talking about. After Mort Cinder and Paramus, I wasn't expecting to not love the art, but what impressed me as before was also Osterhell's writing. He takes an almost stream of consciousness, fragment by fragment approach to writing where you're not necessarily getting complete sentences or even sentences that transition to one another. They seem like rapid fire snatches, sometimes echoing the machine gun guerrilla warfare that's being depicted in these pages and at other times offering sensations and thoughts in fragments. Fragments. When coupled with the mixture of art styles that this book provides, it is really a biography like few else that I've read. Che is a very controversial figure and over a period of time, his popularity or resonance has waxed and waned. This comic written so soon after his death, there are things in here that have been corrected because in the first edition, it was coming out so fast that they didn't have time to put stuff in. Coming out so soon after his death, this really is a more more mythic story which is nevertheless given an incredible realism and visceralness by the art. The mixing of the dramatic writing and the stark art is one of the best combinations that I have recently read. This edition also contains a fantastic foreword and afterword which illuminates the Breccias as well as the tragic story of writer Osterheld and creates almost a second story that echoes throughout this slim little volume. So, I mean, it really packs a lot in. The Forest by Thomas Ott is another hardcover from Fantagraphics. And just like with Breccia, Fantagraphics has published other books by Thomas Ott. In previous videos of mine, I've talked briefly about Cinema Panopticum as well as the numbers 73304, etc. Uh, previously from Fantagraphics in these handsome cloth-spined hardcovers. And these are just fantastic comics. Thomas Ott works in the medium of Scratchboard, which I've recently learned is when the entire paper or surface is covered in black and then you scratch away the black paint or ink to reveal the white underneath. And that means that every single image of his has been meticulously etched out in this way. Now, even if I hadn't heard about this process, I think the effect on it and how different it looks and how it contributes to this kind of storytelling, I think that's just unmistakable. Everything feels uh, like the light is just struggling to be in there. It's because it's being etched out of the black, you have to sort of carve the light into these images, which gives them all a kind of heavy, oppressive feeling, which makes it a perfect match for the kind of not horror, not spooky, but unsettling stories, stories about unease that may erupt 
those kind of stories that Thomas Ott is so good at. The number 73304 is a novel. Uh, Cinema Panopticum is a story cycle for seemingly unrelated stories that are connected through a frame story that can then be read as a novel. Both of these books were magnificent, and that's why I was so excited to get my hands on The Forest, the third Thomas Ott book that I now own. And from the very cover, you can see that art style has only evolved or gotten even more complex. The Forest is a little different from the other Thomas Ott books in so far as although it uses the same style and the same medium and very much conveys the same mood, every page of this comic is one single panel. And it's not a very long book, just 25 pages, but that's 25 such full page images that read next to each other, once again give you, in my opinion, a masterpiece of unease. Every single image invites and dares you to look closer to see if there is anything that you're missing and you'll often turn back to previous pages just to appreciate something. So you'll be going back and forth, not only moving through this. And Although there isn't much to spoil, I'm not going to show any more pages because one of the things that Thomas Ott does, I think, is subvert expectations. And this was no exception. It really surprised me. And as much as I have loved Thomas Ott before this, I think this has just cemented my adoration of him. I hope you enjoyed this video. Once again, thank you so much for your support and kindness. All of you, not just the people who have given me money, something that I'm still a little astonished by. This has been For the Love of Comics. Thank you for watching and I'll see you at the next video.